In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 to 2, God says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, that ye shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Well, from this passage and others, we know that God Himself established and divinely appointed holy convocations, which by definition from the Hebrew means sacred assemblies, or perhaps quite literally dress rehearsals. And since God calls them my feasts and the feasts of the Lord, and links their observance to very precise instructions for His people to carefully observe them in perpetuity, Shouldn't we as Jew or Gentile understand what they are and why God established them? Well, today Dr. Isaac Crockett and I will begin a two-part emphasis on the feasts of the Lord, understanding their prophetic significance throughout Scripture. Now, throughout Scripture, the feasts that God delineates in Leviticus 23 and which the world and even Christendom generally refers to as Jewish feast never really started with the Jews and in reality are not exclusively Jewish, but global, and for all of mankind. Let me read again a bit from Leviticus 23, 1 and 2. Hear Yahweh the Lord. It says, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord. They are my appointed feasts. With the establishment of appointed feasts of the Lord, they are truly holy convocations designated by God as His feasts. And God took personal possession of something divinely holy. And any time God establishes a day or an event such as the feasts of the Lord, they automatically become sacred and significant. Similarly, when God makes a promise, it's also sacred and significant. For example, when God says to all of mankind in Genesis that my spirit shall not always strive with mankind, it means something. When God says my covenant in regard to never again sending a worldwide flood, or my covenant to the Abraham and his descendants, being the Jewish people in the nation of Israel, or the church in the church age, it means something. It's sacred, significant. Now, in these cases, God takes the full responsibility for the fulfillment and the protection of the essence of these things. No man can change them or slow them down. To ignore them is to be actually run over by them. With God, all things have meaning, and all meaning is truth, and all truth points directly to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, the very Son of God who is the embodiment of truth. And as God's people, we must keep our eyes focused and our hope fixed on those sacred times and promises. So to walk through this theme, I'm glad to invite to stand in the gap. Mr. Ten Vanden Legham, Director of Synagogue and Church Engagement for the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, and also the Director of the Joseph Project. He's also a 26-year former U.S. Air veteran, uh, serving for a time in the White House Communications Agency during the G.W. Bush administration. And with that, let me welcome to the program today Mr. Ted Vanden Legham. Ted, thank you for being with us today on Stand in the Gap TV. And thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be with with you this morning. Um, Ted, I would like, if just possible, since our audience here does not know you at all, uh, you were born a Jew, okay? Uh, could you just share briefly, for the sake of our audience, uh, your conversion to Christ when you came to understand and acknowledge that uh, Messiah, in fact, was Yeshua? Well, it really started for me um, right as I graduated from high school. My best friend that I had grown up with had recently uh, come to know the Lord um, in a Calvary Chapel church in St. Louis, Missouri. And I had joined, enlisted in the Air Force after I had graduated high school. And the night before I left for basic training, he came over to share the gospel with me. It was the first time anybody had ever shared uh, about Jesus, about Yeshua with me. And, uh, but it didn't stop there. Um, the, the next morning when I went to the, um, in processing, uh, MEP station in St. Louis, uh, a gentleman came up and gave me, uh, my first copy of the Bible it was a Gideon's man. And he shared the gospel with me. 
Um, I got to uh, basic training in the in uh, the, my wingman in, in the bunk above me in basic training. He would read the Bible to the flight every night and exposit what that meant. And then I got to my technical training at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, and my roommate there was a believer. Then I got to my first duty station uh, many months later, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. And my roommate there, uh, who was also a co-worker, was a on fire believer in the Lord and who was attending a local Baptist church. And it really culminated with um, on Halloween night of 1989, I had been invited to a, a evangelistic outreach that the church was doing to do photography. Uh, which I did as a side job. And that night I heard the gospel presented over and over and over again. And it was on Halloween night of 1989 that I decided to give my life and surrender my life to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Hmm. Uh, Ted, what a testimony. I love to hear testimonies. And uh, I know that that was helpful for all of those who are watching us right now. But it puts you in a position of being able to comment on our theme today and next week, that of the feasts of the Lord, because you bring a perspective as a Jewish man, but now um, a believer in Jesus Christ as we look at these feasts, and that perspective is very important. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with us, and we'll be back in just a bit. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment? For warning signs. The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website for more information. Visit LighthouseTV.org to stay connected. There you can find out what's currently on the air and coming up. How to watch in your area on cable, satellite, broadcast, or streaming devices. Watch past programs or our live stream. Follow us on social media and learn more about the station, our hosts, and our programming. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and we're talking about a dress rehearsal. And if you've ever been involved in dramatic productions, uh, you kind of probably know what that is. In high school and college, I was on some drama crews, and my wife and I actually led a, a group of college students all over the nation doing dramas, Christian dramas. And the, the dress rehearsal is just like the real thing, except there's not the audience, and it's not exactly the real thing, but it's uh, you're going through, making sure everything makes sense, and, and everybody's in character and in costume. And today we're looking at the Feast of the Lord. This is a two-part series, and we're seeing how the Feast of the Lord, in many ways, are kind of like a, a, a production, a dress rehearsal of what is to come or what uh, was to come in those days. So, uh, Ted, you, you've just shared your, your amazing testimony of how you were born into a Jewish home and, and raised Jewish and how the Lord worked on you to, uh, as Sam says, to become a complete uh, uh, Jew by becoming a true Christian, a believer in, in Yeshua and Jesus as the Christ. And, uh, and now you work with the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America um, as this completed Jew, as this Christian who's a you know, Jewish man who understands that, you know, what Jesus came to do and, and who he really is, how do you see the significance of the feast? We've been looking at to Leviticus 23, but the feasts that were given to us, how important are those for both Jewish people and Christian people? I believe that the feasts of the Lord um, 
are important for not not just the Jewish people, uh, but for for everybody who's a believer who names the name of Jesus or Yeshua as their Lord and Savior, because really they're a prophetic timepiece. Um, the rebirth of Israel was a prophetic super sign for the world that uh, time is that that prophetic time clock is running out as we draw closer to Jesus's return. And these feasts that are given to us in Leviticus 23 are really a picture of both Jesus's first coming in the spring feasts and his second coming in the fall feasts. And in his first coming, he step by step methodically fulfilled those feasts. And in his second coming, he will fulfill the fall feasts. And so with that in mind, it's important uh, for us as believers who, who are maybe not from a Jewish background to at least have an understanding of the prophetic meaning of these feasts for all of us. That's fascinating, the way they uh, work with the advents of Christ, his, his first coming, his second coming. Could, we're going to try to dig into that in these, this program and the next program, but could you just kind of give us a broad category of, of here's what are the feasts and, and kind of their broad relation to what you just mentioned? Sure. So in, in Leviticus 23, which I refer to kind of as the keys to prophecy, is mm. the Lord gives these appointments. Um, the we call them holidays today, but the, the word in Hebrew is Moedim, which means appointment. It's like an appointment of the Lord. And he gives the, the, the weekly Sabbath, and then he gives seven seasonal feasts, four in the spring and three in the fall. And the first one, uh, most of us in the church world are familiar with, that's Passover, or we say P Pesach in Hebrew. And we know that Jesus fulfilled the Passover as the Passover lamb who removes the sin of the world. Um, or took the sin of the world upon his shoulders um, when he died upon the cross. The very next day is a holiday that is less familiar to the church world, um, and uh, that's called Hag HaMatzah, and it's the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the day that follows that, um, the very next day after that, is First Fruits, or Habikarim. It's the first fruits of the barley harvest in during the time of the temple, the high priest, the Kohen Hagadol, he would go in uh, to the temple, to the holy place, and he would wave the Aviv barley before the Lord. Um, and then 50 days later, uh, the fourth and final spring feast, which comes at the end of spring, the beginning of summer, is Shavuot, or what we would refer to as Pentecost. Um, and that's the, 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 the first fruits of the wheat harvest, when the wheat harvest is coming in. And so these are the first four feasts that come in the spring, but there's three that come in the fall. And the first fall feast uh, we call Yom uh, Teruah in the Bible. Uh, today it's called Rosh Hashanah, but in the Bible it's called Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. Um, Ten days later comes the highest, holiest day on the biblical calendar, Yom Kippur, uh, mm -hmm. the Day of Atonement. And then five days later begins a week-long festival called Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. And these are really a picture of Jesus' second coming. All right, Ted, that's excellent. That's a great overview for those who are watching. A spring feast, fall feast, four in the spring, three in the fall. Let's now begin to walk down through in the balance of today's program. Let's go back to Passover. What is the, when the, Jew, when, when the Jews uh, observe that, what are they envisioning? And then uh, tie in with, as we go through all of these, what does it symbolize in the prophetic sense and also, at the same time, are you answering that? Because they're all behind us now. How was it completed in regard to Christ's first coming? Yeah, sir. So Passover, really, the story of Passover begins in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we see an account where Adam and Eve have both sinned and realized that they're uncovered or they're naked. And... Um, we see there in Genesis chapter 3 that they make a covering for themselves out of fig leaves. Um, in a sense, they're trying to make their own covering, but uh, it's, it's dead works. But we see there in Genesis 3 that God himself makes a covering for Adam and Eve out of animal skins. And, you know, what happens if you take the skin off an animal? It's going to die. And so the sages, the Jewish sages, see this as the very first sacrifice for sin by whose hand? By God by God's hand and no, none other. He is the one who makes the covering for Adam and Eve out of animal skins. And this is the first sacrifice. And it's a picture of what was going to come in the fullness of time at the appointed time when God would send his Messiah uh, to die 
as a substitutionary sacrifice. And this theme of substitutionary sacrifice continues through Genesis into Genesis 15 when God directs Abraham to make a blood path with these animals that are split in half. And God himself is the one who passes between the pieces, which was an act of covenant. And then uh, later on in uh, Genesis 22, we see God direct Abraham to take Isaac up on the mountain. And God provides a ram caught in the thicket by his horn. And that becomes a substitutionary sacrifice. And then finally, in Exodus 12, we see the Passover lamb. And, and during the, the Passover account in Exodus 12, they were directed to put the blood over the top of the door and on the two sides of the door. Well, that blood on the top of the door drips down. So every door had a blood cross. The death angel passed over. And this was all a picture of what was going to come. God's plan A, which was substitutionary sacrifice, a sacrifice by the hand of God himself and none other. And that fullness of that is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Uh, at the crucifixion, you're talking about it. What a perfect, Absolutely. what a perfect picture. All right, we could spend so much more time on this, but let's walk into the second and the third. You and I have had a discussion about the second and third feasts on our Stand on the Gap Today radio program. And just by the way that came out, I'm going to lump these together because they're so intricately uh, tied. That's the second feast and the third feast as found in Leviticus 23. Do you identify them and do the same thing? What do they symbolize? Yeah. Yeah, so the very next day after the Passover is Hag Hamatzah, unleavened bread. And leaven has always been a picture of sin. And Hag Hamatzah is really a picture of the removal of sin. Um, it's a picture of removal. And Jesus is in the grave during Hag Hamatzah. He's removed. His body's removed. Um and it's a picture of the removal of sin. And this runs the whole a whole week long um, after Passover. The very next day after Hag Hamatzah comes the um, Habikarim, the first fruits. It's the first fruits of the Aviv barley, the spring barley. And the priest would take it into the temple and wave it before the Lord. And this is a picture of the first fruits of resurrection. Jesus fulfills this as the first fruits of resurrection. But it's not just Jesus himself who resurrects. Um, but others resurrect along with Jesus, and there's 500 witnesses to this, according to the book of Acts. But there's a greater resurrection coming at the end of the age. Um, the, that's a part of the blessed hope that, you know, at the end of the age, when Jesus comes for his, for his bride, for the church, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead in Christ. And, but his resurrection was a first fruits. Um, and then from there, we flow into the fourth and the final feast, um, Shavuot or Pentecost. Okay, let me follow up, if I can, with you on that. The, the, the second feast uh, of unleavened bread, uh, would you describe the symbology uh -huh. of what goes into that leaven and its makeup and how that so perfectly applies to the body of Jesus Christ on the cross and after? Certainly. So during Passover, you know, um, after Passover and during unleavened bread, we eat a, a special bread called matzah. And it has to have four requirements to con be considered kosher for this for this celebration. Number one, it has to have no leaven in it, which is a picture of no sin. But there's three other requirements for this matzah to be kosher, this unleavened bread um, that we eat during Hag ha matzah. And, and it looks like a giant cracker. But um, three, three other requirements are that it be pierced. Um, it has these little holes in it. And then it would be striped. It has these lines on it. And then it's, it's slightly burned. And they call that bruised. So it has to be pierced, striped, and bruised, and unleavened. And there's only one figure in all of humanity who was pierced, striped, and bruised. As Isaiah prophesies, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. And he's the one without leaven. Mm. I, I love the picture mm. that that brings us to, mm. uh, right to Christ. Like you said, no other. What about the, the final one? Um, some people who go to Protestant churches maybe celebrate, you know, Pentecost Sunday. But what is the Feast of Pentecost? And, and how does that, you know, point us to Christ? Well, you know, a lot of people in the church think um, the first Pentecost was in the book of Acts, but mm. actually Pentecost begins all the way back um, in, in Exodus chapter 32 um, at the at the base of Mount Sinai. The first mm. Pentecost, Moses is up on the mountain. The children of Israel think he's dead. They um, convince Aaron to make the golden 
half. And uh, Moses comes down with the first set of Ten Commandments on the first Pentecost, writ God's word written on emblazoned on stone tablets by the hand of God himself. Moses finds the children of Israel worshiping the golden calf, and he, he destroys the golden calf. He, he breaks the first set of Ten Commandments. But then if you read there in Exodus 32, he tells the Levites to go through the camp and kill and from entrance to entrance of the camp. And on the first Pentecost, about 3,000 people die. 1,500 years later, the word of God comes down and is emblazoned on the tablets of the heart of men by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Um, no longer on stone tablets, but now on the hearts of men. And, and they go out from the upper room and preach the gospel, the good news. And how many get saved? About 3,000. You see the connection there? And, and during, during Shavuot or Pentecost, one of the things we read is from Ezekiel 36 about um, our stony heart being turned to a fleshy heart, a heart that can receive God's word. Amen. And, uh, and, and Ted... Uh, just because of the time, I'm not going to go into any further discussions on it, but just a quick comment here. The fulfillment, prophetical fulfillment chronologically of the first of the spring feast with these events, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, Pentecost, how closely were these actually fulfilled? To the very day, Ted? To the very day, God was fulfilling this prophetic calendar to the very day on Passover, on unleavened bread, on first fruits, and on Pentecost. He was taking away the sin of the world, dying as a substitutionary sacrifice, resurrected from the grave, and the beginning of the church age in, in Pentecost, this harvest, which is a picture of a harvest of, of the nations. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. We'll be back for just some concluding comments, but only God can accomplish these amazing things, fulfillment of prophecy to the very, very day. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. years, pastors have carried the light of the gospel through opposition, persecution, and every flaming arrow of the enemy. But sadly, now more than ever, our nation is experiencing a period of spiritual darkness. But what would happen if churches threw off the shackles of fear and boldly stood for truth? If 100,000 pastors around the nation joined together and committed to preaching God's Word no matter the consequence, pastors who are unaffected by changing times and the opinions of men, what would happen if America's pulpits became aflame with the preaching of righteousness? The great darkness from rejecting God's standards would be expelled, the prayers of God's people heard, our nation healed, and God's blessings restored. The time has come to stand. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. Our program today is the first part of the Feast of the Lord, and we're talking with uh, our good friend Ted Van Vlindegum, uh, for the Director of Synagogue and Church Engagement for the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. And Ted, you've just taken us through the, the, first, the four feasts of spring, 
and tied it into what happened when Jesus Christ came uh, and just so exact the details of this dress rehearsal, as it were, of, of the coming of, the, of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Could you just talk to us from your perspective, growing up Jewish and now knowing who Jesus is, uh, what is the most important lesson for us to learn from these feasts? Well, I think, you know, looking at these feasts, God in his great mercy and love for us has saw fit to communicate over and over from generation to generation, this powerful prophetic picture of his plan A, his plan A all the way from the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter three to the end of age is substitutionary sacrifice that Yeshua, Jesus himself would be the one who would die to take away the sin of the world, be resurrected and ascend into heaven. But that's not the end of the story. He's going to come back for us and 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 come back for his his church, his his body of believers, and we, and this is the blessed hope that we have to look forward to that um, that eternity begins when we say yes to Yeshua, and these feasts are are a powerful prophetic picture of that. And 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 Ted, um, do you think again only in about thirty or forty seconds here? Do you think that Jewish people around the world who have not yet come to Yeshua, do you find that their eyes are being opened perhaps as they observe these feasts and consider that, um, that God is in the process of fulfilling his plan of redemption before their very eyes? You know, I think for Jewish people, when they come to Messiah and they all of a sudden they can see how Yeshua has been pictured in these all along, mm -hmm. It's 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 mind blowing because the truth was there all along, and many Jewish people are coming to faith um, at a greater number than ever in in human history. It's it's considered that there may be as many as a million Jewish believers um, out of fifteen million Jewish people worldwide today who understand mm. now that Yeshua is the Messiah, and there's an openness to the fact that Yeshua is the promised Messiah that we've never seen before. And only, ladies and gentlemen, can God do these things if our eyes are opened, and that's why we're going over the feasts of the Lord here today and next week. So come back and join us as we spend next week looking at the fall feast, all again with the purpose of saying God laid down his plan long ago. He has completed the first part. The second part is yet to come, and it's right before us. We should be seeing it. And we should be anticipating it. With that, I thank you for watching us today. Communicate to us this week. Pray for us as we work on these programs, and we pray for you that God will work in your life prayerfully, hopefully, that you also will be better prepared to stand in the gap for truth.